In many ways, I was a Pharisee from birth who loved to continually attempt to validate my progress in theological training by knowing and retaining as much information about God and the Scripture and the nature of man as I could accrue. I grew up the son of a Southern Baptist pastor with a deep love for the Word of God and um, loved Bible drills and Sunday school and found a way that I could beat the other kids to the right answers. And nevertheless, as I approached adulthood, when I would hear the word theology, I increasingly felt second class. More and more, it seemed that my knowledge of God was not as developed or as informed as other men. And began to think that maybe uh, true theology, true uh, knowing God with our mind is, is for real pastors and lyrics and melodies and emotionally knowing God is really the realm of worship leaders. Maybe it's preaching pastors and professors who have the corner on deep truth, while worship leaders are relegated to the shallow waters of elementary learning. And I was wrong. Theology is not intended for the elite, but for all of God's people. One of the promises of the new covenant is that God would write His law upon our hearts. Hebrews 10, 16 says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. So we are able to know God first because He has revealed Himself to us. In the late 21st century, between the rise of the praise and worship movement and the dawn of the seeker-sensitive church, the modern expression of the worship leader was birthed. Now, it was shaped by influential songwriters at first and later by Christian pop stars. And the song leaders of churches went through a tremendous reformation. In many ways, this shift in culture has been a healthy one, and we ought to thank God for that. In other ways, the function of uh, the people leading the worship of God has been glorified to a status that's unimaginable in the canon of Scripture. So there's confusion over our role. Are we pastors who sing, or are we artists who are also pastors? What does our theology say about the role of worship, and specifically the worship leader? So I began to ask these questions and have dialogue with friends from around the country. And as I traveled speaking and just finding out more about this, I figured out the need that we are still in need of a movement toward a robust theology of worship. One of the greatest needs of the church today is theological worshipers with a blazing passion for truth and the glory of God. And our worship should not be driven by pragmatism, but rather informed by the Word of God. Worship leaders are called to be men who pursue and practice biblical worship and call their churches to the same. As we look further into the marriage of doxology and theology, we will discover how they shape both worship and the worship leader. So it's toward this end I would like us to look at Psalm 96 and see how it calls us to five marks of the worship of the church. Uh, the first mark of the worship of the church is that uh, our worship is to be theocentric. That just means God-centered. We see in Psalm 96 uh, this microcosm of some very crucial perspectives that Scripture gives to us. The psalm was originally written for the covenant people of God when uh, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. We read about this in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. So let's examine how this psalm shapes doxology, theology, the worship leader, and even the mission of the church. Starting in verse 1, Psalm 96 says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. All right, so what we see here are six imperatives commanded by God through the psalmist. Imperatives are things that God commands us to do. There are three calls for us to sing to the Lord, and one call each to bless His name, to tell of His salvation from day to day, and one to declare His glory among the nations. So this psalm is itself modeling this worshipful response for us as the people of God. And in the commands to sing, what kind of singing is called for? Who should be singing? What types of songs are decreed? The church's worship should be marked by a God-centered, Trinitarian gospel emphasis. So the first thing we'll look at through this lens is what kind of singing is called for. We see uh, these three imperatives, sing to the Lord, right? So when the church is gathered together in the name of God, only singing which glorifies Him is appropriate. 
So we don't sing corporally because it was our idea. We sing because it was God's idea for his people to sing. So since it's God who's commanded us, who has called us to sing, it's God who will also determine what kind of songs that we will sing. We are to sing to him and for him, so both to him and for him. Our songs are not meant to be entertainment or as a distraction from God. As God's people, the primary content of our songs we see in Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, are psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So in that reality, our worship should express more of what God has done for us and less of what we will do for Him. Now, the worship leader is often tasked with choosing the songs to be sung in church. So this should be done with great intentionality and great care. Mark Dever and Michael Lawrence give us this advice both to pastors and to us as worship leaders. And they say, as the main teaching pastor, or I would inject, or worship leader here, it is your responsibility to shepherd the congregation into the green pastures of God-centered, gospel-centered songs and away from the arid plains of theological vacuity, meditations on human experience, and emotional frenzy. All right, so weightlessness is a result of deficient theological perspective. Do you ever feel like just the songs that we're singing are just weightless? So from preaching to singing, when we develop primarily a man-centered view of worship, an anthropocentric view of worship, rather than a God-centered view of worship, this is what we sense. We sense this just disconnect of, of gravity and weight to what we're doing, both in song and in sermon, and ultimately when we're gathered together as the people of God. So my proposal here is not that addressing the needs of man is not in sight, right? We gather for the edification of the saints. But my aim is that to propose that as we call the attention of our congregations first to God and to His revelation, then in that reality is when man's needs are addressed and met as well. So the edification of the church, evangelism, disciple-making are all benefits of God-centered worship. And what we see modeled in this psalm is a God-centered view of worship that then edifies hearers by reminding them of our salvation. We see that in verse 2. While also producing an evangelistic effect. We're not quite there yet. We'll see that later in the psalm. But we see in this text that we are to sing also new songs, right? The church has been given a song to sing. And our song is a song of salvation, as a people of God, we are meant to be continually both writing new songs that confess the tenets of our faith in fresh and creative, meaningful ways, singing new songs. However, new songs are not an end in themselves. You see, the new song that we sing is actually informed by the old song, and it also looks with anticipation toward the new song that we will sing in heaven. As worship leaders, songs are a constant part of our ministry. It's vital for the worship leader to learn from the songs of church history and to be informed by men and women who have penned the hymnals of the church. So it's through the lens of the past and with an eye to the future that we find the place of our songwriting. And the next question we ask from just these verse, few verses of the passage is, who is to sing this new song? All right, We see in verse 3, all the earth is beckoned to sing the praises of God and to bless His name. So we don't worship in isolation, drawing a circle around ourselves and imagining this time is just meant for me and God. No, corporate worship in the church serves as a rich time for the people to practice Colossians 3.16, which says that we are teaching one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So far too often the singing of modern churches has focused more on the sound of the instruments than on the sound of gathered voices raised in proclaiming the worship of God. There is a time for being still and being alone and for just being us and God. But corporate worship, congregational worship, is not the environment for this to happen. This is primarily about us as the people of God to respond to the truths that He has revealed to us. The second mark of congregational worship is that it is biblically formed. That it's biblically formed. So worship leaders ought to come to lead the people of God with a guitar in one hand and a Bible in the other and know how to use each weapon well. We are people formed by the Word of God, and it's His Word that calls us to worship. 
The only element needed for congregational worship to occur is the Word of God laid open in the midst of His people. And we see a fascinating overtone in this passage about the character and the nature of God in that it calls us to Trinitarian singing. So you see this? Three times a psalmist calls us to sing to the Lord. I'm not saying this is a blatant Trinitarian reference, but I'm saying there are, there are triadic nuances here. So immediately we can't help but suppose that there is a method to the refrain and the intentionality in this redundancy by the psalmist. So it was Charles Spurgeon, the great Puritan pastor, who comes to our aid here, and this is what he says. Thrice, three times, is the name of the Lord repeated, and not without meaning. The sacred fire of adoration only burns with vehement flame, where the Trinity is believed in and beloved. So it's with the psalmist's words and Spurgeon's passionate exposition that we are reminded that we're people who worship the Father through the Son by the Spirit. So far too often we overlook the importance of this fact that we are a people who worship a Trinitarian God. Apart from the revelation and the initiation of the Trinity, worship is impossible. Without the wisdom of the Father and the work of the Son and the presence of the Spirit, we cannot worship God. Now, we don't pursue theology as an end in of itself. To do so would be the pursuit of knowledge rather than the pursuit of God. And there's a grave difference between knowing about God and knowing God. John Piper elaborates to this end. He says, if we just know him in our minds, we're not doing anything different than the devil. The devil is one of the most theological, orthodox beings in the universe. He just hates what he knows about God. So oftentimes in matters of theological discussion, our tendency can be aimed at information. We forget that our final objective should be communion with God. God. The chief end of theology is doxology. Theology also shapes doxology. So Christian worship is built upon, it's shaped by, and saturated with Scripture. So our doxology is informed by divine revelation. For the worship leader, our beliefs and convictions about God are what serve as the foundation for worship. A love for the Word of God is a primary requirement for those who will lead in worship. Without a vivid belief in the inerrancy and sufficiency of the Word of God, our services and our lives will never find a rhythm of worship. The rhythm of worship is revelation and response. God reveals and we respond. And this will also always be the pattern. Our beliefs about God's revelation are what dictate our response. So as worship leaders who lead the people of God in the worship of God, above all things, should be men and women who pursue growing in the grace and knowledge of God through immersing ourselves in Scripture. The theology is not reserved for academia and people in ivory towers. No, friends, theology is for us. Worship leaders need to be theologians, letting our theology inform our song choices, inform the liturgy that we write, inform the choice of Scriptures that we read, if we don't carefully consider who God is and who we are as His people, our services will be flippant and clumsy. And what we believe about God surely shapes our worship of Him. Worship serves doxology.